Uh, good morning. My name is Matt Patterson. I'm the chairman and CEO at Audentes Therapeutics, and uh, it's also my great pleasure to serve as chairman of ARM this year and next. Looking forward to working with Janet and the team and all the members and constituents of the organization. So, uh, But mostly right now, it's my pleasure to moderate a panel with uh, several of my colleagues in the gene therapy and gene editing space. I want to start off by letting the guys know that I heard from a birdie that it's still difficult to hear in the back of the room, so try to speak up as best as you can. Uh, as moderator, I'm going to take my opportunity to uh, take some liberties with the subject matter a little bit. Uh, first of all, the definition of the title of the panel is specific to gene therapy, but uh, the companies represented here work on more than just gene therapy. They work on different forms of gene therapy, but they also work in uh, g the gene editing community, so we'll be doing more than, talking about more than gene therapy, at least gene replacement therapy. Uh, we're also going to take some liberties in that we're not just going to focus on 2019, uh, but we're also going to take the opportunity to reflect a bit on 2018. And uh, that was my major uh, holiday email to these guys was to think about uh, if they had to reflect on the year gone by, uh, what might they focus on? And, and then, of course, going forward, what are the things that are most important to them, what's on their radar? Uh, like I said in my note, guys, I would appreciate it if, uh, in addition to your specific points, that we try to keep it conversational and, uh, and uh, dynamic. So uh, with that, I'm going to ask them to give brief introductions. We're not going to do uh, long dissertations, um, but brief introductions. And uh, with that, each of them, I told them I want them to throw out one prediction for 2019. Uh, which we'll come back to a little later because we're going to start with the 2018 reflection. But uh, with that, why don't we go forward. Uh, Matt, why don't you start us off? All right, thanks, Matt. Appreciate the introduction. Um, and my name is Matt Kane, part of the team at Precision Biosciences. We are a non-CRISPR-based genome editing company uh, with activities uh, in cancer immunotherapy with an allogeneic or donor-derived CAR-T platform, uh, the first product of which uh, we anticipate being in human clinical trials later this quarter. Uh, we also have an in vivo gene correction uh, platform um, that uh, we've been developing over the last several years, um, some data of which uh, was published in Nature Biotechnology last summer, uh, detailing uh, what we believe is the, the first um, published in vivo data showing highly efficient and as yet uh, without any uh, signs of toxicity uh, gene editing in a non-human primate model. So very excited about that. And then finally, to uh, bolster Matt's earlier point, we also have a food editing business that I'm sure all of you are highly interested in today, although we, we are frankly quite bullish around it. Um, we're really focused on addressing needs driven by uh, climate change and shifting uh, consumer preferences. Uh, the lead program there is partnered with a um, leader in, uh, in canola oils, Cargill, uh, that's uh, been progressing very nicely. So. Um, Predictions for 2019. This, will, this is on video too, so you guys will get to make fun of me a year from now. Um, I'd actually love to get Jeff and, uh, and Dan's views on this as well, but um, I'm pretty bullish that we're going to see uh, payers start more rapidly adopting more creative payment models for, for these gene therapy programs. I think Novartis has certainly poked the bear, and uh, I think this is going to help really speed up uh, the transition into maybe a more intelligent um, business and commercial model for uh, for these emerging gene therapies. Great. Thanks, Matt. Dan? Thanks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dan Fega. I'm with Spark Therapeutics. I run uh, Corporate Strategy and Public Affairs. Uh, we are a fully integrated AAV gene therapy company. We uh, discover, develop, deliver uh, portfolio gene therapies. This past year, we had the approval of our first product called Luxterna, uh, both in the United States and recently in Europe. Uh, broad, broad range of other programs, hemophilia A, hemophilia B. We have a program for Pompe disease entering the clinic shortly, a uh, program for CLN2 disease, which is neurological disorder. Uh, across all of these, uh, these programs I've just uh, named, treating the retina, uh, targeting the liver, targeting the CNS, uh, summing it all up, we are looking to change the chronic treatment paradigm. That's the goal of the company with one-time, long-lasting gene therapies. Think uh, prediction, um, take a slightly different direction, think about where the technology is going. Uh, there are very well-known constraints with AAV gene therapy. I think we're going to start to see very tangible 
progress on solving some of those through the balance of the year. And we'll come back to that a little bit, as well as the application of these technologies to diseases that I think uh, are more commonly heard of uh, and, and a broader, broader application. Thank you. Arthur? Uh, good morning, everybody. Arthur Zianibus, CEO of Homology Medicines. Very nice to be here with all of you today. A lot of people in the room in the back. Um, Homology Medicines is based on a novel family of AAVs that came out of the City of Hope with a bimodal uh, platform. You can either deliver uh, episomes via the standard gene uh, therapy gene replacement mode or actually do AAV-based homologous recombination and do gene insertion directly into the genome. Uh, we have a lead program in PKU, gene therapy, in adults that will be in the clinic uh, this year with data this year. Uh, we announced today, actually, that we just moved forward our first gene editing program in pediatric, pediatric population in PKU. And we also announced today that uh, we have moved forward our first CNS gene therapy for metachromatic leukodystrophy. So very exciting year for us ahead. We'll have data in the first lead program uh, later this year. Uh, prediction, my prediction, and you guys can confirm this by email, was that we were going to see a spate of m and ac activity this year. So that seems to be happening. But uh, notwithstanding that, I'm going to predict the Red Sox win the World Series again. <laughs> And for those of you who want to know the last time that was done, New York Yankees, 1998, 99, and 2000. So it's been a while. So Ar Arthur knows I'm a Yankee fan. So that was, I think, directed somewhat at, at, at me. Um, you suck. Um, You're not the first person who said that. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so my name is Jeff Walsh. And uh, we'll cut that from the tape, right? Um, I love Arthur. Um, so um, we're, I work for Bluebird Bio, and we're a company that focuses on uh, autologous uh, cell therapy across both oncology uh, in partnership with, uh, with Celgene for our lead product, and also in the severe genetic disease uh, field with some of our programs that are uh, late stage uh, clinical. Uh, it was last year at this point at J.P. Morgan, we got a little bold about our uh, regulatory path forward and we stated and, and obviously still state that we should have three um, of the four programs um, at filing or approval by 2022. 20, um, and, and so it's, uh, it's an exciting time to be here in large part because one of those programs we filed for last year in, in the EU and anticipate, um, assuming uh, the regulatory uh, process goes well in the EU, that we will be launching our first product uh, this year in the EU, and then a subsequent series of, of launches of both new indications, new markets, and new products in the, in the years to come. Um, so we're on the beginning of a train of, of a series of, of product launches, which is um, incredible to say. Um, a little daunting, and you heard some of the reasons why it's daunting from the, the panel before. We also have an emerging pipeline of uh, both oncology and severe genetic disease programs anchored in some of the technology deals we've done over the course of last year, and we've done many of them to, to pull together the best in class technologies to aggregate those technologies in a way that allows us to attack um, things like solid tumors in a way that's just fully differentiated. We announced a deal this morning with Inhibirex um, to take advantage of, of the technology and differentiated technology they have as well. Um, but it's really the commercial challenges that are in front of us right now. As you can imagine, we're gearing up in Europe uh, for a commercial world that we've never seen before, and others have, and we're leveraging that experience base. But uh, terribly excited to be here uh, in light of that. And 2000. And your and prediction. So I was going to talk about China and uh, international. Um, care, um, and I'll stick with that because I, I don't need to send this guy any silly you signals, you know. I will be more serious here than Arthur. Um, <laughs> so, so I think China's going to become a bigger part of, of our world going forward, both, um, Maria mentioned it before, from a clinical trials perspective, but also from a research perspective. We spent a little bit of time there as a, a, a team, and it's some, some fascinating things happening there, not only the move to, to become um, more regulated in, in the ways that we feel more comfortable with. But the pace of innovation there is quite remarkable. So I think we're going to see a lot coming out of, of China and just the international uh, care world uh, in general. All right. 
Thanks, all. So don't forget your 2019 prediction, because you're going to have to come back and elaborate a little on that. But, um, but first, we're going to reflect a little on 2018. And one of the things I asked uh, the panel as we were preparing was to not just be totally rosy, uh, everything's wonderful, let's have a balanced conversation. Uh, what were the successes? What were the challenges that we saw? And uh, same thing for 2019. Uh, what do we see as, uh, with great optimism, and what do we see as daunting? So um, with that in mind, why don't we, I'm going to ask Dan to kick us off. Um, Dan, you had the pleasure of saying up here that you're the only fully integrated company because you get to say that you're a commercial company, so congratulations on that. Jeff's hot on your heels, but, um, but with that comes uh, significant progress and experience with Luxturn in particular. So maybe uh, you can reflect uh, on that as your, as your 2018 major Yeah, issue. so, so we, can, we can start off pretty rosy. Uh, we created a path to patient access with Luxterna. 85% uh, of commercial lives are covered across all uh, the large players uh, in the United States. 50% of government uh, covered patients are covered. Uh, we announced this morning the first year of launch, uh, nine to 10 months, we shipped 75 vials of Luxterna. That's 75 eyes worth of treatment. Now this is an ultra rare disease. This is the first time something like that's happened uh, in the gene therapy world, at least for genetic disease, uh, where we've made this type of product available. Not one patient that was eligible with commercial coverage has paid anything out of pocket for that product. And it says a lot when you, when you see some of the media reports on pricing. We'll talk more about where this is going. Uh, part of what we've been able to do is put in place innovative uh, payer and distribution mechanisms for this first product. Uh, now, we have constraints. We have legislative constraints that we're forced to charge all up front uh, the price of the product uh, to value a lifetime, potentially lifetime uh, changing, uh, changing therapeutic. And what that means is you're limited in what you can do with the legislative uh, paradigm today. We are selling direct to payers. That uh, allows us to avoid some of the middlemen charges. We specifically uh, have a way around buy and bill. We can talk more about that. Second is we're offering rebates at a patient level. If, it do if the product doesn't work in the first 30 days, we're giving money back. If the product doesn't work after three years, we're giving money back. So there's innovation in this paradigm. But what we can't do is we can't spread these payments out over time. We're working very collaboratively with uh, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare over the last uh, year plus. Uh, I think there will be progress. I'll let others speak to it as well. And there's going to have to be progress to enable uh, further change. But I think we're off to a really great start. Maybe I'm just going to take the first stab here at, at fluid conversation. Uh, so tr tremendous progress and a lot of creativity in how you guys have approached it. Um, maybe just quickly, any one or two biggest challenges that you guys ran into in that process, some of those conversations. I mean, you. Um, uh, a lot of creativity, whether it's uh, with government payers or private payers or the out-of-pocket costs. Was there something that stood out as a unique I mean, challenge? I, I think the biggest challenge right now is that we haven't seen uh, something come out of CMS yet. Now, we're working with a number of the, uh, the other regulatory agencies. Uh, there's a lot of great momentum. Everyone's saying the right things, and we need to see the action happen. Good. Yeah, I would love to get, it would be great to talk about that some more. All right, Arthur, you're up. 2018 Reflection. Uh, what stands out to you? Yeah, I think for me it was just the um, the regulatory environment uh, in this space has just been tremendous. Uh, you know, you, you hear it from all of you in the audience in terms of your interactions with FDA. We've had terrific interactions with FDA, very helpful, um, setting guidelines on CMC for gene therapy manufacturing, giving you a, a road map to go ahead. Um, it's different than it was 10 years ago back in the day when I was in enzyme replacement uh, therapy at Shire. So um, for me, I think that continued innovative look that Dr. Gottlieb is, has um, bestowed on the FDA and just getting ahead of it, I think we're going to see more of that this year. Um, but that really has uh, changed the paradigm in my mind in, in, in 2018. So I think that's one of the things. I think the other thing is just... Um, just to go to the gene editing side, the progress that we're seeing across the different gene editing modalities, uh, you know, precision leading the way, uh, CRISPR therapeutics, Editas today uh, announcing they've dosed their first LCA10 patient, 
um, the progress we're making with AAV-based um, you know, HR gene insertion that's nuclease-free. Um, I think we're going to start seeing some data this year um, from these companies. That's going to be very encouraging. And I think now that we've got our arm around how this technology can be leveraged and where it should be used and what diseases is it best for, how do you deliver, I think we'll see uh, a lot of progress this year on that front as well. Yeah, it's uh, obviously the regulatory environment and the tone set by Dr. Gottlieb in particular has been quite remarkable. I think uh, an area of concern that comes up is when you look at those data and the number of programs, it's just remarkable. And uh, can the agency keep up? Um, and it's not for any fault of their own. It's just an incredible amount of work. So uh, certainly we all have responsibility for advocating for the agency's resources uh, as those times come up uh, to make sure we can... Uh, and they it doesn't can help, help that they can't go to work right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, uh, that could be a whole other discussion. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, so, Matt, how about you? 2018 reflection. Yeah, the, the really the big moment I thought from 2018 for the, the, the core editing space was it was a day that we knew was going to come. Um, kind of viewed it as the, the other shoe dropping for us, and that was the, the announcement of the, um, the first uh, uh, embryos edited and born using the CRISPR technology. Um, when we look back, um, you know, five, ten years ago when we were kind of starting out in the editing space, um, there wasn't a lot of interest for what we were doing, and that, that really changed when CRISPR came along. And, and the reason for that wasn't because it enabled us to target new sites or, or do different things therapeutically. It, it was that it made it really easy to make these editing enzymes. And for basic research, it's tremendous. It's a huge, made a huge uh, positive uh, for both basic research and for the, the general ecosystem we have. But the flip side to that is that anybody can use it. And we knew something like this was going to happen at some point. We hope that point was further out in time. Um, and so certainly a very scary day uh, and several days for the space. Um, but I was really impressed at um, the, the level-headedness of the response, particularly here in the U.S. and, and globally as well, um, in the fact that you didn't see investors running, running from these companies. They understood the differentiation in terms of approaches, and I think that speaks to the type of investors that are in this space. This space isn't one that's um, largely covered by generalists and the like, but, but investors who really understand what we're doing. So um, again, scary moment for us, but I think uh, uh, one that uh, was, was responded to in a, in a very sober way and uh, gives me a lot of confidence for where, uh, that, that we have a real foundation to build from, from a therapeutic perspective going forward. Great, thanks Matt. Jeff? Yeah, I would say with, with all of the, the great things that happened in, in 2018 with regard to the regulatory advances um, as well as some of the commercial advances and, and uh, certainly ap applaud um, Spark and others for some of the bold moves being taken. Um, I, I think we're, we're um, as an industry, weren't quite expecting the amount of bold moves we needed to take to implement um, this transformative and unique um, care paradigm that we're trying to introduce to, to the field. And so the biggest thing for 18 for me was getting out in open, in the open, all of the challenges of how to commercialize a therapy like this. We, we knew we were going to stumble, at least a lot of us in the field knew we were going to stumble um, because you're trying to create something that doesn't exist today and you're, you're creating something while you're still uh, implementing the normal process of getting something over the regulatory end line and then trying to prepare for commercialization, but introducing this, uh, all of the complexities of commercializing uh, a therapy like this, and Dan certainly can speak uh, more to this. We're just trying to leverage as much as we can from the learnings in 2018 to, to, to get into 19 and start that progressive uh, build of, of learn and go and learn and go and learn and go, which I'm sure happened in 18, but it's going to continue in, in 19. But I, I think that was the biggest thing that came out of it for me was getting all of that out in the open so that all of us can learn from it. Uh, and we all can advance, whether it be on the pricing and reimbursement side or uh, delivering the therapy from the, from, uh, the manufacturing uh, process or making the patient center to all of this. Um, we're all still learning. And that was a great step. Yeah. One of the things I've said before and we've talked about is that as an industry, we often just focus on um, solving the challenges of research and development. 
and innovation is very difficult, and that's always been our focus historically. But now we live in this world where we need to not just do that, but we also have to innovate on the commercial side, and we have to show creativity and thoughtfulness, and, and it requires discussion with all the different stakeholders. So uh, it's incredibly important because what a shame it would be if we lived in a world where we solve the scientific and drug development challenges, but patients can't get access to the products uh, because we haven't put in uh, reimbursement structures or addressed uh, basic uh, challenges within the medical system for a patient to access treatment. So uh, incredibly important. Uh, I'm just going to uh, briefly, my 18 reflection, although uh, I'm not the panelist officially, but uh, Janet mentioned it briefly, but uh, what an incredible year for fundraising and progress uh, financially for the industry, private or public. And then Q4, S&P 500 down 14, NASDAQ down 18, NBI down 21, XBI down 25, and the gene therapy index of about 16 publicly traded companies down 35% in Q4. So that was a painful that, way. That, that was that before sucked. Arthur said that everyone's getting acquired. <laughs> that was a painful, painful way to go into uh, the holidays. Um, uh, for everyone involved, investors and uh, company. Uh, but it was a good reality check. I mean, why, why are our numbers uh, as a field worse than, than the average? Of course, it's because people perceive us to be a higher risk investment, and that was a whole, all about risk off. Um, we've lived in a, a pretty frothy few years of progress and success financially, so some setback was predicted, although that was harsher than I think any of us maybe would have predicted. Uh, but uh, what it does uh, speak to is that people still have a perception of this being high risk, and that's not totally surprising because it's highly innovative, and so that you know, sort of by default comes with added risk. Uh, but it's just incumbent on all of us to continue to execute and to not just solve our scientific challenges, but to solve the commercial challenges and show that we can be successful, look stern off to a good start, uh, so that investors have confidence that we can, uh, uh, and we can as an industry ride through you know, difficult times. Uh, and we certainly will. All right, 2019, back to it. Do you even remember what you said earlier on? Not sure. Um, so uh, we're gonna mix it up a little bit. Jeff, let's go back to you. Um, uh, looking forward, you know, key issues for you and, and, uh, and Bluebird. So are we going back to the predictions or? Sure. Yeah, elaborate on your prediction from earlier. Yeah, and that, then if there's that other wasn't, things, you know, go that wasn't necessarily a bluebird comment that, sure. I, that I was making. I was, it was more of a, uh, a broader perspective, I think. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that is maybe a bit of a, a bluebird learning as we, we go into Europe, and we're, we've been in Europe for the last uh, two years now, getting prepared hopefully for this moment in, in 2019 of launching our first product is we start the relationship with, in particular for the center of excellence, um, or the centers that we're uh, recruiting, and they're recruiting us, quite frankly, um, because they're so excited about gene and cell therapy. Um, and not us specifically, I just mean we are an example of how excited they are about gene and cell therapy. So there's a mutual interest in being one of those centers. And because they do see it as cutting edge, and one of the things that we're seeing, and this will get to the point of international care here in a second, um, is we're seeing institutions, hospitals within Europe, building out units within the hospital that are geared toward not only dealing with the populations in their country that have the disease, whatever the disease is that they're, they're uh, getting ready for, but, but also to, to become that preeminent gene and cell therapy institution for international care. That's a remarkable statement that, that um, organizations, and I'm sure it's happening in the US as well, but we definitely see it in Europe because they're anticipating patients coming from abroad, wherever that may be. And for thalassemia, it could be from Southeast Asia, it could be from places like China or the Middle East, um, in advance of potentially, obviously, uh, th them, uh, those countries having their own cell and gene therapy infrastructure and, and, and capabilities that, that are being built as we speak. Um, but that speaks to this international care component that we are not as an industry yet focused on because we're so focused on trying to get it right in the, in the environments that are front and center to us, and that makes total sense. But it, it's coming, and how to deal with the flow of international patients across borders is gonna be a really interesting uh, thing to grapple with. That's true even within Europe, 
uh, across borders because you can't be when you're launching a product of this complexity in every country out the gates. It's a slow, progressive build, and you get it right with the first country, you learn, and you get it right with the second country, and you, you iterate. But then there's, there's China as well, and we've seen this already um, through our clinical presentations at, for example, ASH, where um, companies like Legend c come out of the blue for, for a, lot of, a lot of us, didn't really see that coming. Um, there was another Chinese company that presented data uh, at ASH as well this year that wasn't on everybody's radar screen. And those are examples of the innovation that's happening within China. Um, and, and there are some, some risks, obviously, uh, associated with the Chinese market in terms of the regulatory environment um, changing and uh, not being similar to, to uh, US or European markets historically. But that is changing pretty rapidly. And I think you're going to start seeing more and more innovation coming out of China in, in particular, as well as the opportunity to leverage China for the clinical capacity that they have. It is remarkable how much clinical capacity is there to treat patients. Uh, the amount of investment that's happening in the hospital environment, and particularly in the transplant environment, is unbelievable. So th there's something there that's going to emerge, whether it's in 19 or beyond. We're going to start seeing that type of internationalization of gene and cell therapy at maybe even a more rapid pace than we, we've even seen it in, in the US and Europe. Great. Any uh, comments to that, or you want to? Dan, you want to jump I'll, in on that? I'll say I agree. I mean, I, I think it will be an interesting uh, transition period over the next five plus years, uh, particularly in diseases where there is a infrastructure that's in place, and these novel therapies are coming in and, and going to change that. But if we wake up in five to 10 years from now, I just can't see how the infrastructure looks the same. Uh, it's not just around pricing and, and distribution of our products, but it's also about how it's gonna get delivered on the medical side. And I just wanna say I agree, I think it's a great point. And we see it happening as well and where we're playing. Well, why don't you keep rolling then on your uh, 2019 prediction? Um, you wanna expand yeah, on your earlier point? Mine my, my was a bit more, more technology focused, but when you, when you step back and look at the sector, uh, we're looking at uh, we're looking at five pure play companies right now that were born to deliver DNA therapeutics. I can't think of a rare disease company that's not uh, forward in integrating into these types of technologies. It's, it's hard to find one right now. Um, and you look at the large caps, and I, I won't steal your thunder a little bit, but there's you know, there's a, a large segment of them that are trying to play in the space, and they're all taking different angles on where and how their expertise are going to be. There's a lot of money in the space, and uh, I think it's something like eight plus billion dollars of new capital in, into the uh, cell and gene therapy in the past year. There have been long known challenges with at least AAV technologies uh, around eligibility, uh, particularly the immunogenicity of the capsids, um, the potential for redosing, and we're all spending an exceptional amount of time in these, in these areas. Um, the academia landscape is a multiplier of where it was years ago uh, in focus here as well. And we're starting to see, um, I think, tangible progress. And over the course of the year, so this will be the prediction, maybe it takes a little bit longer, uh, I, I think we'll start to see real uh, preclinical evidence to be able to solve these issues. And where this really sums into is we can't all chase the same 20, 30 diseases. Uh, the technology is ready. I think we've shown, and there's a lot to come, but we've shown the early days of of delivery for safe products. Again, a lot to come here. Um, so I'm not making any, any broad claims on safety. But you're gonna see these technologies applied, applied to uh, more common diseases. And we can dive into, I'm curious if other panelists have any thoughts on it. Uh, but there's just too much energy and money and people focused here to not see this move to the next steps. So I think you'll see it you know, wholesale in 2019 uh, starting to happen and, and announcements coming. Yeah, just certainly don't argue with that. Uh, Arthur? Uh, I'm just going to keep talking about the Red Sox to annoy Jeff, but, um, you know, I think where I was headed around m and I think we're, you know, Janet showed uh, a laundry list of companies that are now coming into the space, um, and just the number of clinical readouts you're going to see this year from these companies, and I think you're going to start to see kind of a bifurcation of the companies that, you know, had it right out of the gate or figured it out along the way and those that just couldn't quite get there. And I think what you'll start to see 
uh, as Dan alluded to, are, are the big guys coming in and swooping in and, and taking up um, those kind of companies. So there'll be a consolidation, I think, of assets. Uh, we saw this kind of on a micro scale with the PTC acquisition of Agilis and then Amicus's acquisition of Selenex. So I, I think you're going to start to see that. Um, and I agree, you know, the big guys, the big pharma, big biotech are very interested in this space. Some of them have a strategy. A lot of them don't have a strategy. Um, every time you talk to them, they have a different strategy. Um, so I think they're trying to figure it out. But I think eventually they will, because I think that you can't look to the future and survive as a company if you're not in this space. It's just it's that simple. This is a transformational kind of science. We're figuring out the science ahead of almost you know, kind of anything else uh, on the policy side, on, on the payer side. But I think that kind of progress can't be ignored. So I, I just have a follow-up question. That I, I totally agree that it's hard to figure out the strategies of, of some big pharma. There are some have clearly declared, I'm in, and I want to be a part of it. It's one of my pillars. There are others that are dabbling, and it's hard to figure out the dabbling, how that actually all ties together. I, curious from your perspective, anybody else, is that going to change this year? We've been talking about that changing for three, four years of suddenly pharma jumping in in a bigger way, and there's been some examples of that, but it's been a select few other than some, some deals. I'm just curious on everybody's perspective on that. Uh, my sense is, at least in 2019, that it's still going to be primarily the few uh, that have done a ton of work and uh, have clearly invested in the space. That's just what feels more likely to me, but uh, happy to hear from others on their perspective. Yeah, I, I would agree on the, on the gene therapy, gene correction side. I think in um, cancer immunotherapy, I think there's clear interest uh, in a lot of um, a lot of pressure to to partner with companies like ours but there certainly seems to be a bit of a wait and see approach um, more broadly speaking uh, with large pharma though there are a number that have to Arthur's point clearly defined a strategy and are looking to execute yeah I'll, I'll add to it as well it, I think it comes based on where we're all focused so great points in on the oncology side of things you're seeing more folks playing there uh, in, in novel technologies in AV gene therapy if you're in the hemophilia business I can't imagine that you're looking at your franchise in 10 or 15 years if you're not in in gene therapy thinking too highly about what that business looks like um, I think it really depends on where and how we're playing to see some of these larger guys move in I mean, Novartis we put a, a relationship in place with them. They're selling Luxterna outside the United States. They obviously bought a, a Vexus this past year. Um, Pfizer's had huge investments in, in manufacturing. They have a, a, an early portfolio and they're working with us in hemophilia B. That's what we've seen. It's this step in. I think there's a few players, like Arthur said, that are, uh, that are there and there to stay. And I think we'll, we'll see how it all evolves, but I'm not sure we're threatening every large cap farm as spaces yet. And until that happens, I, I think the consolidation's on hold. Matt, 2019. So we talked about my, my uh, payer prediction, which uh, again, I'll pay for that one. Um, so maybe I'll we'll switch gears a little bit. Uh, I think um, one of the things we'll also see in, in the, uh, the broader gene therapy space, and also maybe for me more importantly in the gene editing space, um, is a lot more clarity around wh where, where could we go, where's the potential for the space, versus where are we now? And I think that's going to um, both help to shape the identities of these companies. Um, it's going to create more clarity for potential partners around when does it make more sense to use a Lenti-based approach, AAV, uh, or pure editing nucleases. Um, and then it'll also enable us to have more clarity around where we need to set our research priorities. So um, I think there is going to be some fallout. I think there'll be some stumbles. Uh, this year from, in particular, some of the gene editing companies um, whose strategies maybe are, are a little bit ahead of, of where we are today. Um, but I think on the whole it'll be a positive because we'll have a lot more clarity around what is tangible, what is possible today, where can we make a real impact for patients today and focus those nearer, nearer term efforts there um, before we get out ahead of our skis. So. Yeah, I uh, just want to go back, Arthur, to one of the things you said in addition to large pharma interest in the space. You mentioned that you thought there um, may be companies that thrive and others that, that don't as much. Um, I think that's something that's on my mind as well. You know, it's been wonderful to see the degree of enthusiasm in the space and the amount of investment, but 
I think when you look at a, the, the vast, a lot of the programs out there, you see, well, that's a tough scientific target or that's going to be really tough clinical endpoints or manufacturing is really challenging. So um, it sounds like that was what you're, the point you're trying to make. I mean, is that in a field where I think we are all very optimistic, you're going to have mostly positive news. I also expect there'll be setbacks. That's okay. I mean, that's innovation, but I think it's in part due to this onslaught of interest in the space and what targets people are going after and, and the challenges associated with that. Was that what you were getting at also? Yeah, no, that's exactly what I was getting at. And I think, um, look, you know, we've, we've talked about it, uh, you know, amongst us that, you know, not everybody's going to win and, and it's a hard thing to do to get something all the way from the bench all the way uh, to patients. So. Um, I think there'll be those opportunities there to, um, you know, to look at programs that you give them another shot or you take a different approach or you, um, you know, partner with somebody else. I think, I think there'll be those kind of opportunities in 2019. I'm going to go back to the commercial conversation for one second. And uh, it's a little bit of U.S. heavy conversation, so sorry for our international friends in the audience. but. Uh, the conversation, and Dan, you uh, talked about it quite a bit, but each of you talked a little bit. Uh, it's going to be an incredibly active year, I think, in the conversation of drug pricing. I think that's not I'm not going on a very big, very uh, long limb to say that at least in Washington D.C., drug pricing will be an important part of the conversation. But um, when it comes to that, I think uh, hopefully we'll find ourselves in a position where we're able to distinguish the innovation and importance of the type of work we do from. Uh, other issues in our industry that certainly need solving. Um, but when it comes to specific, these often one-time therapy treatments and the system that we think we need to optimize patient access, which to me means the opportunity to do payment over time. doesn't mean it has to be the right fit for everyone necessarily, but uh, we don't structurally have the opportunity to do that today in the United States. There's people that advocate for working CMS as a key driver in that conversation, and so that's sort of a regulatory path. Can we work with CMS to achieve goals there and, and put in payment over time structures for, for programs that make sense? And, uh, and can we also consider legislation? Because I think most people in the field feel that eventually you're going to need some sort of legislative solution to truly enable CMS in particular uh, to uh, implement uh, good payment over time structures. So. Uh, does anyone have any additional thoughts we can share on that or, or predictions, I guess, for the year? I mean, from my perspective, and we know it's not, uh, it's not confidential knowledge, there's a bill that's being potentially introduced in Washington sponsored by Ca Senators Cassidy and uh, Warner that touches on these issues, but, but also seems to go a bit more broad and, and I fear will be more about the rhetoric of drug pricing in Washington than about our field specifically. But so it's going to be in the news flow. Um, I don't know, uh, Dan in particular, you've lived it more than, than the rest of us recently, but um, any thoughts on that, any predictions, uh, or from any of you for that matter? We're, we're, we're going to see Novartis do something uh, sometime soon, right, with, with the SMA uh, product. You know, they've, they've announced, they tend to do this, they announce, you know, high prices, four or five million dollars, I think it's worth in their, in their eyes. SMA is a disease where there's three, four, five hundred, I don't know exactly, but there's a lot of people, unfortunately, children born with this disease every year. It's a lot bigger than Luxterna, so it creates a different type of issue. Uh, Spinraza is out on the market, so there is a proxy for, for price. Um, I think a, you know, a big thing as we think about these therapies moving forward are, are you still taking Spinraza once you take the gene therapy or not? Are they stacked or, or are the products going away? I think that's going to be a component of this that needs to get figured out. Um, we think about a lot in hemophilia. If you're taking a hemophilia gene therapy, or you're not fa taking factor, or if you are, what happens? And so there's going to be uh, a lot of thought that has to get put into what type of market are you entering? Are there products available today, even if the gene therapy outcomes are better? Uh, but you know, to the point, not to be overly repetitive, uh, the mechanisms are in place to do this over time. So right now we're a little bit forced. Uh, we'll see what Novartis does. Uh, and there's, you know, I think it's more 2020, but a lot of other therapeutics coming, it seems like, that are going to face the same thing. Maybe I can add, add a, a comment to this. I, I think, Matt, you're right. We have to be in both arenas. We have to play in both arenas, um, have to work with CMS and continue to push innovative um, programs, including the, the kind of trial programs that they, they do afford. And, and so uh, we have to continue to push hard to be bolder and bolder. Um, 
and that's not true, not only true in the U.S., it's true, and true in, in Europe as well, but we have to work with Congress um, in making sure that it lands well for our field. And you're right, it is a broad, a broad bill that's being introduced, a broad concept that's being introduced. We have to have our role there, and that's incumbent upon the companies to stay involved, but also this is where ARM can play a huge role in helping bring all of the power of what's in this room together to influence uh, the outcome um, uh, of those legislative uh, acts. And, uh, and I, th I know that, uh, that effort is, is underway. Um, so so uh, not to put you on the spot, but I'm gonna. Um, you know, as a company that is getting ready to get there, you've obviously had these conversations around pricing, market access, how much of it right now for you guys is driven by your own internal, internal thinking? And then how much do you guys have an eye on what's going on externally? And you know, how, how does that dynamic play for you guys? Just out of curiosity, given you're right at the precipice here. The, um, you have to play both. So you, you obviously, every company has their own self-interest, their own strategies that, that are uh, imperative to implement for your specific circumstance. So um, we've got our fair share of internal policy people and, and contractors uh, are around the U.S. And, and in Europe, for sure. But we also have a, a responsibility to make sure that we're moving, obviously, the field forward as well. And, and so there, in there, there is some tension. There's always going to be some, some tension there. And trying to find that right balance is, I think, I think the key. And, and you certainly have experienced it yourself, and we're all thinking about it. Matt, I know you're thinking about that, uh, that too. So it's, 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 it's hard. It is hard. We, we say it all the time at Spark. If, if you've developed these products and patients can't get access to them, you failed. Right? It's, it's on us. It's on us to work with everyone else around us. Good. I'm going to wrap up by just expanding a little bit on what Jeff said uh, a second ago, which is that uh, education and awareness about this field and, and what we're doing, the potential we have for patients, is absolutely critical, whether we're talking about uh, elected representatives or our friends in the media or elsewhere, uh, or our friends, or our family members or friends, right? Because especially in the, in the rhetoric of drug pricing discussions, it's just terribly important that we find a way to come up with solutions in our system that protect the innovation of this field. Uh, ARM will play an important leadership role in that conversation. But ARM alone can't solve that issue. If you're in this room, it's because you're either already in the space or you're very interested in this space. And I hope that you think of it as also a personal responsibility in a way uh, to educate your friends and any other uh, person that you come across uh, that just doesn't understand uh, this field and the power of this field because I think that's going to be critical uh, to our long-term success and I hope it's an obligation that all of you will uh, take on. Uh, with that, I think we're going to wrap up. I'm going to say thanks to uh, the panelists. Uh, we're finishing two minutes early, so you're welcome for the two minutes you just got back in your schedule. Uh, <clears throat>